doing today preparing for the lord's return such a time as this you know you were put here for such a time as this and today we're going to talk about fellowship and what it really means to not forsake fellowship from a scriptural perspective and what the church is is it a building or is it a people and does it mean that we have to gather on their terms on the masonic brick and mortar church's terms or do we gather together under the terms the Holy Spirit would lead us into. Hallelujah. Mic check one and two. Hopefully it's working. 
So guys, I'm glad you're here. We're going to talk about that today. And we're going to talk about some of the pitfalls of going into these brick and mortar churches that you can run into that can actually hurt you real bad because they're not really operating in the Holy Spirit. They're operating in a demonic spirit. They are the wolves in sheep's clothing that the Lord warned us about, warned us about in Matthew 24. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to look through some of their signs and symbols again to kind of show you that they're letting us know who they are before we even show up and you know I think it was some eastern guy I can't remember exactly who it was maybe Buddha that said and I don't want to quote Buddha for any other reason but he said symbols control the rule of the world and there is truth in that at least from the satanic perspective they use their symbols and I'm going to show you dozens and dozens of symbols inside what calls itself the church, the people that are trying to draw you in, keep you in, keep you tithing, keep you bowing the knee to their quote leadership, which puts you subservient to them and not to the Lord. They make people twice the children of hell as they are. And I want to show you how they tell you who they are over and over again. And then they get you in there and they confuse you and they try to get you to stick because you are breaking the fellowship rule by leaving them. When you're not leaving the body of Christ, you're just leaving them. So I'm going to try to help strengthen people that are in this situation to come out today through Scripture, through the Word of God, through the truth from the Word, and also from revealing to you guys just how much of this stuff that goes on in the church. But before we begin, as always, let's pray. Father God, we just praise you and thank you for this opportunity to speak truth in a world of darkness. But you are the real light, not the Luciferian light. You are the real light. And I'm asking you by your Holy Spirit to bring the truth into the light so that we as your people can see the truth and listen, obey, to follow in your commandments, to follow after you and to be led of you. I'm asking that no flesh would speak during today's message, Father. I'm asking you to take over and to run the show, Father God. Let it not be from my intellect. Let it be from what you're leading so that everyone can be fed of you, Lord, and not of me. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray I bind up any demonic interference here in this place in the well. Uh, I plead the blood of Jesus over me and everything here, all my technology, all this place. In Jesus' mighty name, and I also plead the blood of Jesus over every listener that's a believer, and I come against any demonic spirit that would interfere with the receiving of this word, or the, I bind up any convolution of this word, or any um, twisting of this word in the ears of a listener, and I loose that only the truth would be received. In the mighty, mighty, mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Let's say hi to some people. Chucky, glad you're here. Whitestone. Um, Chucky Whitestone, Chucky Whitestone. Miss Missanity. Lynn, glad you're here. And uh, a few others. Tiona, Carol, Carol, good to see you. Gary, good to see you. And Pretty Puppy from Australia, glad you're here, as well as Little Lamb. And Jesus Ruiz, glad you're here, buddy. So let's get started. So, of course, I'm thinking about how a lot of these churches will tell you to forsake, not to fellowship. And let's go ahead and go to that scripture where they talk about it, where the word speaks of it. It's in Hebrews 10, verse 24. It says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So we're trying to be... Um, ones who provoke, which means to instigate a good thing, that is love and good works in other people, not forsaking the assembly, assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So they use that scripture to try to lock you into their Masonic temples, and they do this. They, they really pivot off this scripture. They try to make you feel guilty for not coming to their services on Sunday, which is idolatry to begin with, because the Sabbath is supposed to be on the seventh day of the week. Or if you're not there Wednesday, if you're not uh, in service to everybody there, then you're forsaking fellowship because you're not at their church. And I'm here to tell you that today's brick and mortar church is not necessarily where you need to be. And I'm going to show you a lot of different things to look for in terms of uh, trying to stay out of that situation. And I might, I might have messed up my screen a little bit. Sorry about that. Let me fix that really quick. There we go. Okay, so moving on, just want to continue going to the scriptures first before we believe anything that they tell us. So I want to show you that the church itself is, is not a place, but it's a people and it's you. 
So there was a woman at the well that Jesus spoke to, you know, the one with the five husbands that he told her about, about, and she said unto him, sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the father. Ye worship, ye know not what we know what we worship for salvation of the, of the, is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the father in spirit and in truth for the father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We are in worship everywhere. We don't have to go to a building. We don't have to be in a special place. We have the kingdom of God within us. And I'm going to go ahead and go to that scripture now. The Pharisees uh, demanded of Jesus when, when the kingdom of God should come. He answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. So what does that mean? That means the Holy Spirit has come to make its abode in us, those of us that have received the Holy Spirit, uh, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Out of our bellies shall flow rivers of living waters. That's where the Holy Spirit is supposed to be. So you don't have to go to a building to gather. And you'll see that the early church uh, didn't necessarily do so. <laughs> they, didn't, they, they would go into the temple and synagogues from time to time, but their assemblies happened outside of these buildings. But first, let's just go to Eaton's, Easton's Bible Dictionary really quick to find out what the real meaning of the word church is in, in the scriptures. Um, one way that church has been um, defined is it's probably derived from the Greek kurikon, which is the Lord's house, which was used by ancient authors for the place of worship. But in the New T Testament, it is the translation of the Greek word ecclesia, which is the synonym, which is synonymous with the Hebrew word kahel of the Old Testament, Kahal, I mean, of the Old Testament, both words meaning simply an assembly. So an assembly, a congregating, a joining, a grouping of people together in a single place does not have to be in a building. If you think about Moses, he didn't go to any church building. Abraham didn't go to any church building. Um, and I'm going to show you that John, he preached outside of the buildings. Uh, John the Baptist, that is, who was the forerunner of Christ, and we are forerunners of Christ for the second time. It says, uh, Matthew 3, verse 1, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If you go down, then went out, went out to him, Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan were baptized of him, of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. They left the synagogues and the temple to go see him outside. So I'm not saying you can't assemble in a building. If I had people come to this building, it's, I'm not making a, a big deal of that, but I'm telling you that it doesn't have to be. You know, Jesus said, where two or three of us are gathered in his name, there he is in the midst. You could have uh, home services led of the Holy Ghost and not of man, but they want you in their places to be not only led of them, but to be subservient to them so they can put you in bondage and slavery, not only to them with the money, but to sin. They want you in the same sin that they're in. And I'm going to show you how deep the rabbit trail goes in terms of, of sin in the church. Now, you know when Jesus was talking about if their brother trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, that thou hast gained thy brother. Uh, but then you take him to two or three more, and if, if, if they don't hear, then take him to the church. But if you neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and publican. You're not taking him to a building. You're taking him to other people to respond. And I'm just using scripture now to reemphasize that the building is not it. Here, I want to use another scripture to do that, where Peter, Jesus asked the disciples, his, the apostles, who do you say that I am? And, and, and Peter answered, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered, said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. I say also unto thee thou, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So on this rock, what is the rock? The rock is the faith and belief that, belief that Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior, and that belief on him is going to bring you into everlasting life. That's the rock that is that of his faith that Jesus was the son of the living God. That's the rock that the church is being built on. The church is the assembly, the body of Christ, the people that make up the body of Christ. That's the church, the assembly. And of course, in the early church, 
Um, it says here in verse 47 of Acts 2 that the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And uh, these were people that were added to the number, not to more bricks to a building. You know, of course, about Philip when he preached to the Ethiopian man uh, on the side of the road and he baptized him there because there was a there was a little pond there and he baptized him there. That's in Acts chapter 8 verses 25 through 40. Go check that out. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but church can happen anywhere with two or three people. And I'm telling you, you will get a lot more in terms of blessing from two or three people that are really walking with the Lord than an entire building full of people doing idolatry like we're about to see. Well, I'm so glad there's so many people here. We've got 28 people here, but only eight likes. If you guys could do us a huge favor and hit that like button, we'll be more likely to recommend it to other people uh, with their algorithm. So sure, appreciate any likes we can get. Chucky says, Catholics say the rock is the Pope and Peter was the first Pope. Of course, we all disagree with that. But it was his faith that he built upon the rock and he was called Peter because of that faith and that belief and that it was the Holy Ghost that revealed it unto him. Okay, so now I want to segue into the occult and Masonic and the witchcraft aspects of what's going on in these brick and mortars that insist that you fellowship with them. So let's go on to that. So I've already shown you in the days prior uh, different images such as this one of the Baphomet. And you can see there's as above, so below symbolism with his one hand going up, one hand going down. There's moon, crescent moon symbolism. One is uh, white, the other is black, so that's the duality. Of course, he's got a goat head uh, representing the Baphomet and the horns. And of course, he has breasts. He, as we discussed, um, he's both male and female, and he has a rod coming out of his pants with a serpent around it. And you can imagine what that, what that means. And then also he has scales on his uh, stomach there. So uh, we talked about Baphomet. We talked about the pentagram representing um, Satan. That's a five-pointed star. And then, of course, here is the statue that the Satanists made that's uh, displayed, I believe, up in Detroit, the little children looking at it. Um, here's the pentagram pointing down with the Baphomet inside of it. Um, we've also talked a lot in the past about um, pyramids and all-seeing eyes coming from... Uh, the Egyptian, uh, Egyptian paganism. And so you can see on the back of the dollar bill, we have Novus Ordo Seclorum, which means New World Order. And then, of course, we have the 13-tiered um, layered um, pyramid there with the all-seeing eye in a, in a triangle shape above it. We know that all comes from masonry. If you check out this, um, you know what? I'm going to make everything bigger so you guys can see this. You don't necessarily need to see me. Let's cover that all up. So check that out. That's in a Masonic temple. You can see the black and white duality, the checkerboard flooring. Then you also see the um, the square and compass there in the corner and the bottom the bottom tile. And then also, can you see those hexagrams, which are six pointed stars? They look like what people call the Star of David. That's not the Star of David. That's more like the Star of Remphan. All of that comes from paganism. We've talked about this stuff in the past. Here again is the all seeing eye with the square and compass in it. Uh, I want to show you how they use the hexagram as well with the um, square and compass. You can see the ring here on the left has a square and compass on top of the hexagram on the on the side of it. Then you can see how the hexagram, which looks like the Star of David to many of us, um, once it's broken apart, it, it, for, it also forms the uh, square and compass. You can see it also here. They put it on necklace. They'll have a hexagram, star of rim fan, as Katie Lynn says there, with the um, square and compass inside of it, square and compass above. This all comes from sacred geometry, which I'm also going to show you a little bit about. Here we have the pentagram on the left, the five-pointed star, also known as the, uh, the tetragametron, and it has meaning. And then the hexagram, some people call it the seal of Solomon. I still believe it's the star of rim fan. You could see more of the same here. Keep going down. Something else I want you to remember as we start looking into this stuff is that colors and witchcraft, we've been talking about that lately, how witches color their hair. They have colored candles. Um, they all are used in magic. Um, brown is earth, permanence, protection. Black, darkness, removal, completion. White, light, initiation, creation. Red, change, competition, sex. I want you to notice that we're going to look in one church that is entirely red and black, just like a Marilyn Manson stage would be. 
let's just keep moving. I have so much to show you. So here's the as above, so below with a hexagram. Um, it's a triangle pointing down, represents the macrocosm. The triangle pointing up re represents the microcosm. The macrocosm is uh, representative of self, heaven, the infinite, the spirit, darkness, and so on. And it's uh, also, it's the, it's the female version. The microcosm is also self and has a lot of light, lots of different meanings. And these are the union of two people in sexual union. Just to show you one going up, one going down. They represent two different things. Okay, I also want to show you that this tree and their symbolism is as above, so below. So the, the, the roots represent below, as above is the tree. I want to remind you about the eight-pointed star of Ishtar. I know I'm rushing through this stuff. There's so many things to show you. I just want to remind you of the eight-pointed star of Ishtar. Um, and also, they have an eight-spoked wheel of Ishtar. And I don't know if you can see, but in the far right, upper right image, that is the Vatican Square, which has a obelisk coming out of it in the middle. But the, and I, I think they might have changed this recently, but there's an eight pointed spoke wheel of Ishtar that the obelisk comes out of. So the masculine coming out of the feminine. So I'm just reminding you of all this stuff before I show you more. But before we move on from that tree imagery, I just want to show you that some very beloved, quote, Christian bands have used As Above, So Below imagery on their album covers. Switchfoot on their Nothing A Sound album has the tree above and the, the roots below, but it almost looks like the orange represents water. It has two pentagrams on the bottom, no, three pentagrams on the bottom left. It has also the sun and a man on a ladder climbing toward the sun. These are all... Uh, pagan images of sun worship. Then, of course, we have Casting Crowns, their Thrive album. They have the same tree with the leaves on top, but the, the root system below, as above, so below. Also, the other day, I showed you guys Kim Walker Smith, who was of Jesus Culture and Bethel Church, her throne room video that Jesus Culture made for her song. Jesus Culture, obviously, out of Bethel. Um, this video has over 8 million views. It has a as above, so below sim symbolism. I'm not playing you the video like I did last time because I got, I got tagged for a couple things if I show you guys actual videos instead of screenshots. But you can always go back and check these things out yourself. So I'm just showing you how in the church uh, the symbolism has, has been and probably will always be as long as Satan is running these brick and mortars. It's going to be his symbolism. You got to understand the wolf is in the church now. It's not coming to the church. It's not going to show up to the church later on. The wolf is already in the in what calls itself the church, and he's calling himself of Christ. Look at this old band, even Striper. You know they've been around a long time, probably since the '90s. And then look how they have the cross, obviously, and then two um, triangles, and then triangles within it, pyramid shapes within it. These people are practicing witches, leading our children who listen to the most music. Um, has are uh, uh, singing their songs, singing Satan songs in the church. So sacred geometry, uh, just coming from the Wikipedia, ascribes symbolic and sacred meanings to certain geometric shapes and certain geometric proportions. It is associated with the belief that a God, that God is the ge geometer of the world, the geometry used in the design and construction of religious structures and such as churches, temples, mosques, religious monuments, altars, tabernacles has sometimes been considered sacred. But all this geometry stems from witchcraft. It's used in Islam, Hinduism, keep it going, and in phony Christianity. And just to show you some of the symbols that they've used in the so-called sacred geometry, which allows them to do a lot of architecture and whatnot. You can see the yin and yang one there. Here again, we have the as above, so below with a hexagram. I mean, you could make a lifelong study of this stuff. I don't really want to. It's so demonic. I just, I'm getting the creeps telling you guys about this. I want to remind you about churches and steeples and how steeples are nothing less than obelisks. Obelisks are stem from ancient Egypt. They played a vital role in their religion and were prominent in the architecture of the ancient Egyptians. Placed them in pairs at the entrance of the temples. Sound familiar to put two, um, two of them in pairs. They do that in masonry too. Here's an obelisk. Obelisks represent the erect phallus of the sun god Ra. In 
steeples are just a an, an example of that. I'll never go in a building with a steeple again. I don't want to go in a building that's in the shape of an erect penis. They just make them gargantuan in some of these churches. I've had enough of it. I, they, if they tell me, you're forsaken if assemble, I say, well, you can go assemble in your sex temple. I'm not going to do it. Your demonic sex temple. I've talked much about Christmas idolatry in the past, but check this out. Do I need to go in and fellowship in these places? They actually make living Christmas trees. Check that out. These are actually people in the shape of a Christmas tree. I think this is a First Baptist Montgomery, Alabama. Those are all people sitting in tears going all the way up. Let's see how many pointed star this is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. How convenient. An eight pointed star of Ishtar. That's who they worship during Saturnalia. It's all demonic. Let's go to a couple of television networks that call themselves Christian, but clearly aren't. We'll start with Daystar. They're out of the headquarter in DFW, but they have television stations and, and, and uh, cable networks and satellite all over the country and the world. Call themselves Daystar. They've been using a five-pointed tetragrammatron. You can see that this is their leader, Marcus Lamb, preaching to a very small crowd when I watched a little bit of it. He's just so phony. I don't know why they always wear black, but they know why. What does black communicate for them? Always wearing all black and black leather. I mean, what does that mean? Look, there's Joni singing all black. Now, there are these lights in the background. I noticed also that Ben Shapiro's show uses these, and that could be. Now, I might be reaching now. The back could be the all-seeing eye there many times over. But, you know, you might say, well, Doug, you're reaching there. And maybe I am, but you're so accustomed to finding the finding little symbols on their stages. I noticed that when I watched a video of the Blackwood Brothers on Daystar, I mean, I found all of this today, by the way. And at, as soon as I look, I find something. As soon as I look, I find something. So look also on the flooring during the song, while I was playing, these, these eight-pointed uh, star symbols were flying all around. More stars of, and wheels of Ishtar. Let's go on to TBN. And, and you can find hundreds of things on all these channels. Um, TBN, of course, has Joel Osteen featured. And, uh, you know, they've had all of the big Creflo dollars on there in the past. I don't, I don't even have the channel. I haven't watched it in years. But they, they had the TD Snakes, I mean, Jake's. The Kenneth Gloria Copeland's, they've always had all those types of people on there. And uh, it's just ridiculous how demonic and Masonic all these people are. But I just watched one video, which I'm not playing, but I'm going to show you images of. I pulled up this Tim Bowman and Faith City Music, and they were playing on a red and black stage, uh, much like Marilyn Manson would do. They're all wearing white shoes and black outfits with black leather jackets, just like... Um, just like Marcus was. And uh, this looks like, literally like, it could be like a Halloween stage. Faith City Music. Never heard of them before. Don't watch these channels. But it just took me a second. Look how red and black that is. It's total blasphemy network. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. This is so blasphemous. The women are wearing tight pants, but so are the men, skinny jeans. Why do people stand up? I, I, I have led praise and worship enough and I've never felt led to stand up in the shape of a cross. And the guy also looks very effeminate, very effeminate. But let's see what kind of shirt he's wearing here in a second. Keep moving around in the red and black stage. It looks so demonic to the hilt. So incredibly demonic. There he is again. And then I saw on his shirt, St. Laurent. I was like, what is St. Laurent? And I typed it in the search thing and up came... Eve's St. Laurent, a designer. I said, okay, this must be a high fashion designer he's wearing. I was like, hmm, I bet that guy might have been gay. I just guessed it. And I read in his wiki, it's like he was often seen at clubs in France and New York City, as, such as Regine's and Studio 54, and was known to be a heavy drinker and frequent user of cocaine. Then I clicked on a movie about Eve St. Laurent, and in the movie they depict him kissing another man. And uh, I did all this for you guys, by the way. This is just disgusting me. 
And then I found out, I read further in his biography in cooperation with his partner and lover, Pierre Burge, the designer resolved to open his own fashion house. So here we have our Christian guy wearing St. Laurent on his shirt. And he appears to be very feminine, feminine guy. And he's leading worship. Remember what we read about the effeminate going, where are they going to go? They're not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Is that Bobby Brown? <laughs> I guess it's his prerogative. Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> anyway, then I actually looked up St. Laurent, an actual St. Laurent, which was, uh, Laurent means Lawrence in French. And uh, this was a guy that was uh, tortured and murdered because uh, he was a deacon in the early church in Rome. He was responsible for the material goods of the church and distribution of alms to the poor. Ambrose of Milan relates that when the treasures of the church were demanded of Lawrence by the prefect of Rome, so all the treasures he was uh, helping di distribute to the poor, he brought forward the poor to whom he had distributed the treasure as alms. Behold, in these poor persons, the treasures which I promise to show you, to which I will add pearl, pearls and precious stones, those widows and consecrated virgins, virgins, which are the church's crown. The prefect was so angry that he had a great gridiron prepared with hot coals beneath it and had Lawrence placed on it. Hence there at Lawrence association with a gridiron and the martyr had suffered pain for a long time. The legend concludes he cheerfully declared, I'm well done on this side. Turn me over. From this, St. Lawrence derives his patronage of cooks, chefs, and comedians. It's just sick. I'm not, sure, I'm not trying to say that this Faith City Church was trying to make that kind of tie-in, but how do we wear St. Laurent for Eve St. Laurent on our shirt in church when he represents homosexuality, which is forbidden by the Bible? We, we saw that the other day over and over again. It's sick. Now, don't think that Messianic and Hebrew roots aren't showing similar symbol symbolism. That's another reason why I won't go in there. But I had someone, a, a watcher of the channel, uh, send me questions asking about the Sefer. And so I watched a short video on the Sefer. It's a Bible where they changed all the names to the sacred names, the original uh, ver Hebrew words for all the names. And... Uh, they include a bunch of books from the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha in there that were written between Malachi and John the Baptist when God wasn't even speaking to Israel. And then they, um, they restore the Aleph Tav 10,000 times in the Word. So this is a Sefer Bible. So now the first thing I noticed when I looked to the video to learn more about the Sefer Bible, I've seen them before, but I've never really studied out what they are. Look how you have here um, a cross. First of all, we don't use uh, symbols. The second commandment says, thou shalt not make any graven image. So we don't have a cross as our symbol. You've seen Satanists wear crosses left and right. So that tells you that it's not for us, it's for them. And they like to wear a cross because it's a memento mori to keep Christ on the cross. What he's no longer on the cross. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. But look how in the background of it, there's a sun. They always have the sun in their worship these masons, these witches, and then the shapes that are made with their geometry make a upward pointing triangle. And then the top uh, with the crosses on their sides like that make a downward pointing triangle. As above, so below. They always do this mess. I showed you also how um, another person com com claims to be a believing a Messianic Jew, Sid Roth, had all kinds of symbols on his channel, too. Oh, man. And then here we have Messianic Jew Jewish church where they're holding up their so-called stars of David, thinking they're being loyal, and they're not. That's a star of him fan. As above, so below. It's a Masonic symbol. Here's another ministry, Tzedakah Tz Ministries, using the same symbol. Here's a cat, I think, that comes on TBN or Daystar, one of the two who has his hands in a upward pointing triangle symbol, but also his two hands are in the M shape for masonry, the space in between, like uh, was held up by uh, oh, the guy that was represented the Vulcan on Star, Star Trek. He did that same thing with his hands where he spread the two fingers apart. 
and uh, maybe Mork and Mindy too, the old Nanu Nanu thing. These are all Masonic symbol symbols with the hand signs. I haven't shown you many hand signs today because we've done it a lot in the past. Here's another Messianic temple with a five-pointed star. I mean, the, excuse me, the hexagram six-pointed star. Here's another one on, on the outside of their building. They're telling you who they are. All right, let's go to Elevation Church, which is a big uh, church with five or six locations in Charlotte, North Carolina. They, of course, use the upward pointing triangle symbol, upward pointing uh, symbol, it's supposed to elevate up, right? What I found was really, um, really sick about what they're doing. They have an album called Graves into Gardens, and they're using a skeleton as the basis to put the flowers in. And oh my goodness, it's just unbelievable. And of course, Spanish, they got a Spanish music version of it too, but a lot of that stems from Spanish, uh, Mexican worship of Santa Muerte. Muerte means death in Spanish. Nuestra Señora, that means uh, our, our, our Lord or our, our, our female Lord de la Santa Muerte of, of Saint Death. And so it's Our Lady of Holy Death, often shortened to Santa Muerte, is an idol, female deity or folk saint in Mexican and Mexican-American folk Catholicism. Personification of death, she's associated with healing, protection, and safe delivery to the afterlife by her devotees. Despite condemnation by the leaders of the Catholic Church and more recently evangelical movements, her cult has become increasingly prominent since the turn of the 21st century. So now you see Elevation Church including that same symbolism. And I'm sure they'll justify it. Well, what about the dry bones chapter of Ezekiel 37? Whatever. It's Satanism in the church. And this is a Santa Muerte representation. Another church that's big, Andy Stanley's church in Atlanta, stay in the southeast. Look how they have an upward pointing arrow with arrows pointing in every direction. I guess like a compass, but as above, so below. These people don't hide it. They use heart symbols on it. This parent summit, they made it into like a rectangular building almost, I guess, with also at the bottom of it has a pyramid. <laughs> they can't help themselves. Look at this Christmas one. They've got a, a five-pointed star uh, in, in the light. It's literally pointing down. They love to use little light orbs in the background. Then, of course, the snow one is a six-pointed star, the snow little piece of snow on the invitation to Christmas. This was something interesting that I found on their site, Anthology Group Life, Group Studies for Life and Faith, and they have sacred geometry there. They're telling you who they are. They're telling you who they are. They're not hiding it. White Stone says, a man named John Smith showed me the truth about Saturday in lieu of Sunday back in the early 90s. Praise the Lord. Doug, do you think these people are just ignorant or they know what they're doing? I think a lot of people in their churches are ignorant, but the people at the top are not. The ones making the art, they could just be demonized and feeling led to do it, but it's just too planned out. There's too many things that, that uh, come together. Let's get back to that as above, so below idea. So Bethel Church, which, you know, Jesus Culture came out of them. They're in, uh, I want to say, Redding, Redding California. They had this on the very front page of their website. We're excited about, about God and the good things he's doing on earth and love that we get to be a part of it. So as above, so below. They, they want to say they're taking it from where uh, Jesus said, uh, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But Satan likes to take God's word and twist it. Bethel, what's the will of God on earth as, as it is in heaven? So they quote directly there. If it exists there, it's supposed to exist here. But they're really, here we go again, Jesus culture, as above, so below symbology. And there's so much witch, witchcraft represented. I just went to one video of their worship, and I found this uh, girl who was a worship leader. She's got tattoos all over. The Bible forbids tattoos. I'm not saying you can't repent, but what is that creature? What, what is that, that creature? With, it's, it's hard to, to understand. It almost looks like a gray alien with black hair. It's too hard to tell. And she's got something else on her left arm. Some, some female with a scarf around her neck. I mean, 
look, if you've got tattoos from your old life and you repent, that's fine. And that's great. And maybe she does. And I'm saying if she, if, if a person gets tattoos and they repent that they can't go up and sing before the Lord, I'm not saying that at all, but there's just too many things. And when you draw it together, that just show witchcraft, 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 witchcraft. We showed, um, Kim Walker Smith last week wearing her witchcraft robe and her songs and the songs representing witchcraft, the repetitive songs that they sing with 144 times fill me up God in a single 17 minute period where everybody's drawn into Kundalini spirit. So I guess what I'm trying to say through showing you guys all of this, maybe some of it is real. Maybe some of it isn't what I mean is maybe some of it's intentional. Maybe some of it's not. And I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. But when you see the preponderance of the evidence over and over and over again, and then you hear them say many times, forsake not fellowship, you need to come on. I'm not going in your demon temple. I'm not. And we need to remember the scriptures where uh, Jesus literally, uh, where, the, where Revelation literally says to come out of her, my people, and be not partaker of her sins and do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And you know what? I had pulled all those scriptures, but I, I don't know where I put them, so I'm going to load up the Bible here and we're going to find those scriptures too, where you can see that you actually have a right to not go to a place where you're going to be unequally yoked with anybody. It says here, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Unbelievers are people that believe something contrary to the word. Just because they call where they are a church doesn't mean they're a church. You see that we've been lied to over and over again. You need to be in the word so you know what the word says and you know who actually lines up with it. It says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Well, how many of you want to go into a church that's decorated entirely in black and red? The colors of Satan. He always dresses in black and red historically. And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial, which is Baal? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? These are idolaters and their Christmas feasts and their Ishtar feast. They're idolaters coloring their eggs like they did in antiquity. These are death cults and sex cults. For a year, the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. Don't let them hook you back in with, don't, don't forsake the fellowship, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. That's why so many of you that are alone or just with a couple other people are literally just coming to channels like this to get fellowship. That's why you feel so much more peace than these other people. That's why you feel so much more peace. Let's check out the other one. Come out of her. Come out of her means to pull out. And I don't mean to be too vulgar here, but it means do not be in intercourse with her. Pull out. She is a whore. Let's read this together from um, Revelation 18. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, has become the habitation of devils. This, to me, this is the Vatican. And the hold of every foul spirit and every church that has idolatry in it that calls itself Protestant is a daughter of the Vatican. They're still doing what the Vatican has uh, drummed up throughout history. They're still doing it. They're still uh, worshiping Saturnalia and Ishtar and winter solstice and, and, and spring equinox. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the, of the wrath of her fornications. The Vatican and Catholicism is spread out over the entire world. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth have waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacy sees and i heard another voice from heaven saying come out of her my people that ye be not partaker of her sins and that ye receive not of her plagues for her sins have reached unto heaven 
and God hath remembered her iniquities. The whore of Babylon has joined herself to witchcraft, to the Jezebel spirit, to wickedness. And that's why it's so easy to spot their symbols and all these nasty temples they've built with giant erect phalluses on top. Do not let them cause you in any way to believe that you have to go and fellowship with them when they're doing all this nonsense and this sin. It's ridiculous. For her sins have reached unto heaven, God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you and double unto her double according to her works. And the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So many real believers have been killed by Rome. I'm gonna tell you that right now throughout history. People that got a hold of the real word of God or tried to publish it, they didn't want anybody to have it. When I was in the Catholic Church, they told us that we, we shouldn't read the Bible and if we were gonna do so that we needed a priest to interpret it for us. Now, I'm not saying every Catholic church you could go to says stuff like that, but that's what I was told. They don't want you to understand. That's why they used to say all their masses in Latin. They wanna keep God dead in a dead foreign language and far away from you. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, Queen Jezebel, and am no widow, she'll see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine. She shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. God is judging the Jezebel spirit in the earth. It's no joke. A lot of people wonder if this narcissistic Jezebel spirit is ever going to be judged. It's going to be judged. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and live deliciously with her, she shall bewail her and lament for her. When they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Remember when Jezebel was just in a single moment, just thrown out of that window by her own eunuchs? At the behest of that guy that was below her, I, don't, I wish I hadn't forgotten his name, but the guy was down below. They just threw her right out the window and she died and dogs licked up her blood and ate her. We need to come out of all parts of the church that say they're of him, but are the synagogue of Satan. And it's not just what calls itself Catholicism. It's a bunch of places that we need to come out Violet Girl says they want to keep us on a spinning globe. Exactly. They don't want us to know the truth that there's a firmament above, it says in Genesis. Firmament means hard, hard shell above. They don't want us to know the truth from the word, but if you just read the word, the truth's going to come to you. A script of lies must be burned. Every deception so unlearned, preparing for our Lord's return. I mean, that's one way to become without spot or wrinkle, by the way, is to come to know the Lord and get the lies out of your head, get the deception out of your head. Because deception means that there's evidence that Satan and demons are dealing with you, and they're in your mind. But Jesus said that we, that the Holy Spirit would lead us into all truth. Let's read about that really quick. We don't have to walk around not knowing the truth. We don't have to walk around deceived. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. Not some truth, but all truth. Let me make this so I can make this a little bigger. Here we go. Howbeit, when the Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. He, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will shew you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall shew it unto you. That's why you don't call on the Holy Spirit, guys. You call on the Father through Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit will show you the things that you are in need, need of to see. 
got to get our minds right. We got to get in the truth and we got to stop letting people manipulate us into their narrative that isn't even biblical. When they try to get you hooked into their Sunday services, their Wednesday nights and every other thing, just so you'll be in bondage to their place. We got to come out of that and be stronger. We got to be a little more mature and not to have, be, have to be surrounded by a whole bunch of people all the time. You know, Elijah was all alone during his time. He thought there wasn't anyone else that believed right. But God had to re remind him that 7,000 hadn't bowed the knee to Baal during his time. Let's look that up. Knee, Baal. Sometimes we have to be somewhat alone to make things right. This is quoting it from Romans. It says here that, uh, that Elijah said, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. And that's the truth. There were 7,000 others who hadn't, and he just didn't know them. So we need to trust in what God's showing us from the word and have fellowship with other people that believe the word, not ones that just talk a talk and then they have these huge red flags like Jezebel's and Narcs always do that show you that they don't give a crud about God or pleasing him or doing, thing his, doing things his way. They love to feed the flesh and to party with their Saturnalia gods, their demon gods of Ishtar and Saturnalia and lust and perversion and uncleanness. They don't care about God. They don't want to serve him. We have to, as a people, to stop letting other people dictate what we do. We really do. We have to stop letting other people um, so easily manipulate us because that's what it is. It's manipulation. It's absolute manipulation. And you have to recognize when that's going on. If someone's trying to control you so much that you've got to be somewhere they want you to be and they're not allowing you to make choices of yourself as a free moral agent and they're just trying to push 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 all the time you need to back away from a person like that too much control god doesn't even control us at that level he lets us make choices satan is the controller he's the manipulator i don't know why i'm riding on this so hard i just i just even in, even in spiritual conversations with other people, I think a problem in the church is that we so want to persuade people of our viewpoint that we just tell them our viewpoint and we won't leave them alone unless they believe the same thing we do. And we can't, you can't do that. All, you, all you're required to do is to say it one time and let God do the rest. If you're pressing, 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 or someone's pressing, pressing, pressing you all the time, why are they not trusting the Holy Ghost to begin with to lead you into that thing? Why do they got to be on you constantly? Or maybe they're your handler. Maybe they're a handler come from Satan to twist you up and to mess you up. Someone that wants to control you at that level. It's not God. God doesn't do that. In the prodigal son story, the father didn't try to control his son. He let him go. When he came back of his own volition, he ran out to meet him. Pretty Puppy says, has the word of God been altered by these Masonic forces? What Bible version can we trust now as the inerrant word of God? I mean, I, I don't read the Bible that way, honestly. The King James, for my research, is the one that's the closest. But even then, it uses the word Easter in uh, Acts. And the word clearly in, that, in, in, uh, in Acts is uh, Pasha, which means Passover, the original Greek word that's translated from. So I just know that God has left his word for us and it's line upon line, precept upon precept. And for me, how do I read the Bible? I read the Bible as a red ink. I believe those gospels are true or truthfully uh, submitted to us. And that red ink, it stands above all, whether it's in revelation or in that book. And if anything were to contradict it in my heart and I'm not, or I'm confused about it, I'm going to default to the red ink. 
that's how I'm going to be myself. Because there were some things that Jesus clarified, even about uh, the Torah, that the people were doing that he clarified, particularly with regard to divorce, writing bills of divorcement and whatnot. So if he says something, I go, I go with what, because he's my Lord and Savior, not Paul. I don't try to lift Paul up any more than I should. I don't try to disrespect him, but some people say that, that the writings of Paul are incongruent. Like for me, I have to say that the book of Hebrews doesn't sound like the guy that wrote Romans. It's like two completely different voices speaking there. And I understand people over time can change in voice and writing. I don't think I'm, if you read my writings from today, you wouldn't read my writings from when I was in my twenties and say, Oh, that's the same guy. Maybe, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that couldn't have happened, but for me, I believe the word in English is, is sufficient. And if I have trouble with it, I can use my strongest concordance and go deeper into the Hebrew or the Greek. Firefly says, don't help people that don't want to be helped. Our relationship with, with the Lord is personal. We don't need to guide others to understand God. That's his thing. Yeah. You know, I mean, I sort of take it that way. If God leads me to say something to someone so that their blood won't be on my hands, I'll say it one time, but I don't have to go back and say it again. The, their blood's not on my hands after I've said it once, if God leads me to say it, you know? Salty dog, there are so many words in English that do not mean what they say in Hebrew. I would advise checking them always and then verifying it through other examples in Scripture. You know, I mean, I've had a strong concordance for over 20 years and I've checked a lot of words and I have not found that the translations have been egregiously off. So, but I have found a very strong movement in the Hebrew roots movement to try to get us all to speak Hebrew as if we can't know God in our own language. And I just want to remind everybody that God's the one that separated us by language at, at Babel. Let's go to, let's, let's read that. I got to spell it right. So we're going to go to, let me put it up on the screen. We're going to go to Genesis 11. So we know that during that time, they said, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Well, God wanted them to, to spread out, but they didn't want to do it. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men built it. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them ab abroad from the, thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So the point I want to make there is God separated us by language on purpose, and he made others feel foreign through language. Now, and then they scattered from each other, and they stayed together in tribes based on the language they spoke. So now if you grow up speaking English, or you grow up speaking Spanish or French, it doesn't matter. And suddenly it's thrust upon you as an adult. Well, you're not speaking the holy language. You're supposed to speak Hebrew. You are going to make God feel foreign from you and you're going to separate from him. That's how he separated the peoples by changing their language. I don't find myself and I've been part of keeping the Sabbath on the proper day and trying to do the Torah as they call it the way you should. But, and I've also really enjoyed other languages um, Salty Dog says, I'm not looking down anyone simply saying to check. Yeah, and you can check, but I'm trying to tell you that in the English, I have not found too many uh, different ways that I really needed that Hebrew word to define it for me and that the King James did well enough to define itself, honestly. And I'm just saying that I think it's well and good to do it, but, and I'm not saying you're doing this, but I had a Hebrew roots guy basically tell me I had to learn Hebrew. And I was already studying the original Hebrew many times. I've done it lots of times. But I don't think it's necessary for people that aren't academically inclined, that they can know God just as well through their own language as in Hebrew. And I do have a problem um, when people try to force on others. Not that you're doing that, Salty Dog. I'm not trying to throw stones at you about that. You made that clear. But I'm just saying 
that you don't necessarily have to have a concordance. If you have the Bible and God by his Holy Spirit uh, in your own language, God by his Holy Spirit can use it. Now, if you get an NIV Bible from the Westcott and Hort uh, translations, then you might be in trouble. You know, I remember when I, when I initially realized how messed up that Bible was, I threw it across the room. I think the bl word blood was pulled out of the New Testament over 40 plus times and the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus is the, the, the linchpin to our deliverance in our, in our, in our salvation. So there have been versions that have sought to change it and the King James isn't perfect, but, um, I do believe, um, that it's, su it's sufficient for us. Chick publications made an article on the word Eastern King James Bible. It's a good read. Oh, I'd like to see that. I used to, when I was early on in my walk, had chick, uh, chick tracks, had good ones on Catholicism. They really did. So yeah, John says pretty puppy. Our history is being rewritten before our eyes. It's true. It's really true. And that's why the word getting the word deep down in you, it's good to have a paper version of it. You know, I'm pulling up this one from that was downloaded onto my hard drive, you know, and I guess it, could be changed from afar through the app, but at least I still have paper versions of it and I would definitely get a paper version for sure. Absolutely. Prayer warrior. I agree. K KJV is sufficient. I know no Hebrew. I know Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom. I remember the first time I heard that when I went to Messiah Church and they were singing that and, you know, clapping the, what are those things, tambourines and playing the violins. And I mean, I, I thought that was good music. I was excited. And, and that's all well and good. I love other cultures, but I just don't think that other cultures have to be forced onto us for sure. That's how I feel about that. Well, anyway, guys, just to conclude, don't let anybody draw you into something where you have, you have, the Holy Spirit through discernment popping up a bunch of red flags. Don't let people do that to you. And um, recognize that fellowship and what the church is is not maybe what they're saying. It's not a building. And it is a group of believers, but we're, you know, you can have believers locally near you, but if you can't find people that agree, just keep coming on the inter interwebs. And the, the word says that God will put us in families. Let's see if I can find that. And I believe that in these last days, what we're, what we're enter, entering into, what we're entering into right now, I might have a hard time finding it. The word families is in there so much, but what we're entering to right now, it's going to be small groups, man. I'm telling you that God's going to bring us together to help one another through this time, especially once the halfway point of the tribulation occurs and you can't buy or sell without the mark and we're all sent off into the wilderness, God's going to arrange us and ordain us. Probably not going to be giant groups of thousands of us together, or maybe he will put a th thousands of us together. I don't know. That's what he did with Israel in the desert, but maybe he won't, but we just got to trust him to lead us into the proper families and recognize and use your discernment and use the word of God to rightly discern who's of God and who isn't. And don't end up in groups that are drawing you in to cause you to sin and to go against God's word. That's, um, that's, that's the key. That's all I'm getting at. And, uh, cause they, they will try to manipulate you. They'll use the word to try to manipulate you much like what Satan did to Jesus in the temptation of the wilderness. He, he, he quoted directly from the Psalms, Psalm 91 even. So, um, just recognize they'll do that. But, but if you feel a caution in your heart about going somewhere or being a part of some group, and you don't feel like you should do it, don't let them guilt you into it. I'm, I'm telling you, they, they will try to if there's Satanism, if, they're, if there's demons in them that are trying to lure you away. You, you have to understand that God's people are Satan's most, to him, the most precious mark. He gets the most out of causing us to fall. And it's same with the Jewish people. He gets the most out of getting us to do evil because of the fact that we've been called by his name and that we serve God and he wants us to turn away from God and go to go to the lake of fire that burns with brimstone with him he, he sin loves company and he wants us to join in with him and we don't we don't want to do that we want to stay um with the Lord in Jesus name well I want to go ahead and pray for everybody Father God I just praise you and thank you for this message 
Help us to stick to you and to your people and help us to be worthy of being around other Christians. Help us to dig into the word and to line up our lives with the word. The word says that this is how we know we love the children of God and we love God and keep his commandments. Help us get rid of our idols. Help us get rid of these things that hinder us with you so that once we're unshackled of sin and serving you, we can be a blessing to others. And I'm really asking you, Father God, that you would lead us um, in that pursuit to make things right with you on an individual basis so that we can be worthy of being part of the body of Christ, part of the corporate body, and that you could draw us together. I'm asking you to draw us together into families, Lord. I praise you and thank you for that. In the mighty name of Jesus, for drawing us into families. I pray all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, 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 amen. Thanks for coming, Sarah, Firefly, Rose Flower, ask Sarah for prayer. Um, Carl, my friend Brian said NASA is the acronym for never a straight answer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> always lying to us left and right, my goodness. Pretty puppy, glad you're here. Sonia, Little Lamb, Chucky, Whitestone. So glad all of you guys were here. I'm gonna go ahead and send you out with with song so you guys can finish your conversations and Sarah can say that prayer uh, for, um, I can't remember who requested it. Sorry, someone requested a prayer from Sarah. I'm gonna let you guys go out with a little bit of music and I'll see you on the next broadcast for Without Spot or Blemish Ministry. Thanks for joining us. Every deception so unburned